Anita, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me, Steve. I'm excited to have this conversation. You're one of my oldest friends in the profession. I don't mean oldest. I mean oh, I'm that too. Long standing. So I'm going to start right out of the blocks with you and ask you, what is the best part about being a family lawyer? What gets your juices going? What do you like to do? I think God, there's a lot of things, but I think the people generally, whether it's problem solving with the people that I work with, problem solving with the people that I work for, it's that interaction, the kicking around the ideas, the figuring out a way to tell people's stories better and differently and in a way where the judge will be interested. That's probably the best thing. Uh, what's interesting to me is I wonder if it's the same thing that you like doing when you were a new lawyer. You think you've changed the way you look at things? Oh, completely. Completely. And what was new lawyer in need of like? What did, what did new lawyer in need of like to do? New lawyer Anita did like to write, and you have to understand, I was apprenticed to Arnie Stein at a very young age, and he laid it out pretty clearly. He said, I like to do discovery. That's what I'm going to be doing on our cases. I don't like to do the writing. That's what you're going to be doing on our cases. So I really did like the preparation, the pulling together the data. But the parts that, that's missing when you're a new lawyer is the part where the client is heavily involved and the part where you can follow your own instincts as opposed to following other people's instincts in how to use the material. So you mentioned Arnie Stein. I take it he was one of your early mentors? Arnie was one of my early mentors. Don Schiller was probably my earliest mentor. And then Jim O'Brien, all three very different personalities. You were fortunate to have lawyers of that quality to kind of show you the way in the profession. Absolutely, and I think that for it every day. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Don Schiller. Okay. He's another top gun. All these people are top guns. What, uh, what are some of the things that you learned from him, either directly, something he taught you, or what you learned from observation and osmosis? Well, the funny thing, you talk about observation and osmosis. One of the things Don always told me is that I was like a little sponge. Anything and everything he told me would eventually come back to him by me reminding him of it. I think the biggest thing he did was make it okay for me to ask questions. If he laid out a strategy or an approach and I didn't really understand where it was going to get us to our goal, he always made it okay for me to ask about it, talk about it, and probe. So that was one thing I learned very directly. The other thing I learned very directly is resist the temptation to be the same as everybody else. Be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. And don't fall into, don't fall into the trap of betraying your client in the interest of camaraderie with another lawyer. In other words, when somebody else shows up and tries to create rapport with you by saying, oh, yeah, both of these people in this case are crazy. Don't agree just to create the camaraderie. That, that, isn't, that doesn't help your client. And it will eventually come back to haunt you. That's an important lesson, isn't it? Who are we working for? Exactly. And it was the other thing I think I learned from him is, don't, we're not salesmen. We're not trying to sell people on what we do. We're trying to write prescriptions for people. No doctor is going to guarantee somebody that they can cure their cancer. We can't guarantee people results. All we can really guarantee people is that we'll really try hard, that we'll be creative, that we'll do research, that we won't make assumptions, and that we'll tell their story the best way we can. Would you describe Don as a good teacher? I mean, he's obviously a great lawyer, but would you describe him as a a good teacher? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and his teaching method is Socratic and through strategy. Arnie was also a very good teacher. Arnie taught me how to read tax returns by having me read them sitting right alongside him. He's the one that taught me to love business valuation by reading them, understanding them, and not being afraid to say, hey, business evaluator, this part of your report doesn't really make sense to me. 
who else would you say uh, was a big influence in helping you evolve and, and develop as a lawyer? Um, I would say the part where one of the things Don told me, and I think at the time he was 48 and I was in my 20s. He said, I'm going to do you the favor of making sure that you work really closely with Joe Ducanto because there are things that Joe can give you that I can't give you. Um, he expressed that Joe had an intuition for figuring out what somebody really wanted. And Joe didn't fall victim to getting a client a great financial settlement and having a disappointed client because what was more important to the client was something like maintaining a good relationship with the former spouse or with the child. So Joe had me, you know, Joe spent time with me and Joe taught me how important it is to listen to people. And not just to what they say. For example, when somebody says, I want my spouse out of the house, getting at the reasons why helps you figure out how that person will make decisions for the entire rest of their case. So Joe was a big influence. I would say that my godfather, Phil Robinson, was a huge influence. And I, I'm unique in that I got to choose my godparents. I wasn't baptized into the Catholic faith until I was 19 years old. It was done entirely by choice. And one of the perks was I got to pick my godmother and my godfather. My godfather taught me that if you make yourself indispensable in any work situation, you'll always have a job. How you make yourself indispensable is figuring out better and better ways of doing things. And in our business, how to make things easier for the clients. Teeny example, communicating. Just because I might like to communicate in emails versus phone calls doesn't mean my client will like the same thing. In these days of Zoom, everybody presumed at the beginning of it that everyone would be really excited to video conference. Some people don't really like being on video. And the funny part that drives it is they don't like seeing their own reflection on the camera as they're talking. Yes. So figuring out what communications means are the most comfortable for people really helps cut through a lot of the stuff that can get in the way of, of learning who they are. So you, you have, you're like uh, the lunch meat in a sandwich because you have the senior lawyers who were longtime mentors. Right. You have the junior lawyers who now you have stepped up as their mentors, right? Right. And speaking about communication, one of the things I always work with my associates about is know when to pick up the phone. Not everything oh God, yes. is communicated in an email, right? Yes. Uh, so, so tell me about your mentoring of some of the junior lawyers in your office. What are, what are some of the strategies you use to make them better lawyers? I think the strategy that I like the best is the strategy where they travel alongside me for a particular period of time so that from first thing in the morning until last part of the day, they experience everything I experience. They see everything that I do. Because it isn't just about look at this task, look how I write a letter, look how I draft a pleading, look how I do a phone call. Part of it, and the part that most people miss is, how do you manage it all, prioritize it all, and get it all done within the same day? So somebody who shadows with me will watch everything I do in a day and have the chance to ask questions about it. And I find that in pointing out to them why, for example, did I pick up the phone to talk to this client as opposed to sending an email to that client, they get to learn how to communicate better with people. Most of our business is communications. So I like doing that. I like editing their writing. I love editing their writing to make them stop writing like they're a lawyer. Write like a novelist instead of a lawyer whenever you can. Better storytelling. So um, let, me, let me dive a little bit deeper into your actual strategy of working with new lawyers. So I take it you're mindful of what you're doing and you are using it as a teaching point in real time. Is that kind of how you do it? That's exactly how I do it. So After a court appearance, we'll talk about you saw the things I said. 
here are the things I thought about saying and decided not to say, and here's why I decided not to say them. Because sometimes what we don't say is as important as what we do say. And boy, isn't that an insightful point? That's a, that's a really critical point. Circling back a little bit to the Ducanto lesson about listening and, and trying to figure out by what's not said maybe where people want to go. Can you talk a little more about that? Is that a skill you've developed over the course of time? I like to think so. I, I, as a young lawyer, if somebody, and I'll use the prior example, if somebody said, Anita, get my husband out of the house, get my wife out of the house. I would immediately set about trying to draft something to tell the story to get the person out of the house. You learn by experience that maybe always the best question to ask after that is why do you want them out of the house? And then you take the narrative they give you and you match it up with the legal criteria. And this is where educating your clients helps you. If you just internalize and think, oh God, so much pressure. They want this other person out of the house. They really don't meet the criteria for getting them out of the house. We're gonna go into court and we're gonna lose. You go through that process a few times and then you say, hey, wait a minute. There's a better way to do this. Hey, you know what? I've gone over your story. The two statutes we have to get somebody out of the house are A and B. You don't meet the criteria for either one of them. In my opinion, it would be worse to try to get the person out of the house and fail. Then that would be worse. It would be better because you don't meet the criteria to talk about coping strategies for staying in the house or maybe talk about you getting out of the house. That's the part why whenever I write anything I write, a lot of lawyers start out saying, now comes Mary Jane, you know, by her attorneys, Schiller, DeCano, and Fleck. When I write, I always say, by her counsel, Schiller, DeCano, and Fleck. It's my little way of reminding myself that I'm not just there to be handed a piece of paper like a shopping list and to go out to the store and buy it. I'm there to counsel people on the right decisions to make. And it's good to be realistic about what we can and cannot do. So getting underneath the skin of why will always get you to better results and people appreciate it. Nobody likes to go into court and lose. Lawyers don't like it, clients don't like it. That actually reminds me of um, uh, a mutual friend of ours since deceased, Harold Field, who used to, he would mentor me when I was a young lawyer from time to time. And one of the things that he advised is printing off the statute and handing it to people when you were trying to persuade them that the direction they wanted to head wasn't sustainable. And that's probably a, a, a helpful tip for all of us to remember that. Well, that is the statute and the rules are something that I think a lot of people forget. And one of the things that is part of my teaching, because it was part of my upbringing, is no matter what you want to do, the place to start is reading the statute, reading the rule. If there isn't a statute and there isn't a rule and there isn't a case, then you have a whole nother problem. The best thing to do is start with the statute. How many lawyers do you see writing letters where the statute tells you what you, what you have to have in there and they completely blow something that is, is real basic? So when you give, part of how you cure blank page syndrome is tell people where to start. What do you want to achieve? What statute, think of every statute and every rule that you can use to achieve that goal, read all those criteria, match up your facts. Yeah. You raise a good point because I think what happens is, is we work with the statute all day, every day, and we think we know what it says, but you know, going back to it when you have a new issue and rereading it is really helpful, I think. Exactly. Exactly. So Harold was right. That was one of Arnie's first things. When, he, when we would start to analyze a problem, the first thing he would do is say, all right, let's get out the statute. So if you're getting ready for a legal argument, 
let's just say a contested motion. And, and let's say it's an important motion, maybe not bet the farm, but a big motion. Let's walk through your, your process of how you get your head together and get prepared and, and move forward on something like that. So step one, I take it, is to look at the statute. Well, step one is to take the filings. Usually by the time we're getting ready to argue the motion, we've already written the responses and the replies. So going back and reading those things like they're a book, not like I'm an advocate. Read them like they're a book. Identify the places where I think the other side might be being persuasive. Then go into what assumptions do they make that aren't true, that take away the persuasiveness of their argument. Saran Seaworth, who was one of my, she was probably the first person I worked closely with at SDF. She was our appeals and research guru. And Saran's superpower was identifying the assumptions that somebody didn't state that were embedded. In other words, for this principle to be true, these assumptions have to be true. If the assumptions aren't true, then the principle is out the window. So I always look for the best talking points that maybe aren't in the writings that same way. No judge likes you to stand up and, and just read what you wrote by way of argument. So read it like a novel, identify the assumptions, then figure out the best way to argue that your way is better, then figure out the best way to say the other side stuff doesn't work. Then you get to the place where I always imagine if I only had 10 minutes to speak, what are the things I would say? People don't usually retain auditorily everything they're told. So working in threes and fives, I don't know why they appeal, but they do appeal. So I try to put together my thoughts because if I put together my thoughts and I go over them and over and over them, I can have a conversation with the court instead of reading from a set of notes. Although I do believe in notes. Part of why I believe in notes is I watched Sandra Joan Morris from San Diego when I was an institute, when we were institute students. I watched Sandy very effectively use notes. Sandy could hold a piece of paper here, glance at it every once in a while, and it never made it seem like she was reading from notes. So having your main ideas on that page, having your safety blanket of resource materials and authorities for the court to ask questions, always good. And then the last step, I pretend I'm the judge. I pretend I'm the judge and I say, you know what? What things am I gonna think about in making this decision? Is my decision, if I go Anita's way, gonna create more problems or less problems? More interactions or less interactions? When it's a discovery point, we all know that more judges get reversed on appeal for the discovery they don't allow than for the discovery that they do allow. So figuring out how the judge is gonna make their decision to avoid any error on appeal will always help. And then finally, this is the part that I never did when I was a younger lawyer, but I do it now. Go over the argument with your client so that they understand what you will and won't be saying. There are a few things that will knock you off your game faster. You know, many times we stand at the bench and our client is standing right next to us. You're delivering an argument, you're connecting with the judge, it's all going great. And then like a small child in the grocery store, you feel this little tug at your sleeve. You feel the tug at your sleeve because your client is terrified that you've missed the biggest point in the world because they're not in the loop. It's the motion practice variation on if your client fails at testimony, it's because you didn't do a good enough job at the preparation. Interesting. Um, that's kind of it. So you, you raise an interesting point. And I know that as a writer, I always want to be conscious of who my audience is. Who am I writing to? Am I writing to you or am I writing to somebody who is a year out of law school? Same with an argument, I think. Who are we making this argument for? Sometimes it's not even for the judge. Sometimes it's to send a message to the other side. 
most of the time it's for the judge, but being aware of who our audience is and what will appeal to our audience, pretty important stuff. Exactly. Well, that, that brings up a, a, your idea brings up a really good point. There are some times when we know, we can't be certain that any motion is gonna be a winner, but sometimes we're more certain than others. Explaining to a client that a motion might not work to get what we really want, because there's always a chance that it won't, but that every motion is another opportunity to educate the court about the case facts, educate the court about the legal principles, and get an idea of whether the judge is more or less agreeing with you about the principles or not. Terrible, terrible feelings of regret come from getting to court and wishing you'd had a greater chance to preview things with the trier of fact. Yeah, so there, there certainly are a lot of indirect reasons that we may proceed with a motion or not proceed with a motion. And the wisdom and the discernment that you more or less indicated you've acquired over the years, that's why people want to come to a top gun. That, and I think, I think the thing that most young lawyers miss is when somebody hires somebody to go in and advocate for their life, they want somebody that they know is going to be prepared. They want somebody who's going to present with confidence and the, the courage of their convictions. So when you're giving advice, you have to be thoughtful. You have to make sure you don't give people ideas that they can win things that they can't. But I found, interestingly, even if somebody can't be assured to win, if they know that you'll tell their story and get every point out there, they're willing to take a chance because they want to know. Nobody wants to make a settlement thinking that if they'd gone to trial, they would have gotten a better result. So a lot of times the previewing of the issues the writing of a really persuasive pretrial memorandum. And then you go to the pretrial and maybe you don't get everything you want, but you can come out of it saying, I went over this theory for why you think the value should go this way. And here's what the judge said about why they weren't ready to take that step with us. Then at least they know they've taken their best shot. Because I think really that is what it's about when you're at the top of your field. It's taking the best shot building the best gun, taking the best shot. Yeah, Jim, uh, Jim McLaren, when I talked to him last week, his uh, mentor, his first um, mentor, told him that the law is not black and white, it's gray. And we work in, in the shadows. And a lot of times by thorough preparation and self-confidence and advocating in a meaningful way, you can, you can tilt that balance, even though it looks like a loser to begin with. Well, and, you know, when you talk about shades of gray, how many times does a case not settle because everybody sat there and insisted on agreeing on every value for every asset on the balance sheet, every element of income, every element of deductions? Formulas are great. And I was just having a settlement conference two days ago. And I pointed out to the other lawyer that if they thought we were going to settle the case by everybody agreeing on all the predicates and all the numbers, we were setting ourselves up for failure. Cases get settled in the gray areas. It's one of my earliest Donald Schiller lessons. You can use all the formulas you want to get yourself into the zone of gray. And then leaving things vague so that maybe one person thinks that they're giving a smaller percentage of a larger estate and the other person thinks they're getting a bigger percentage of a smaller estate, you let that gray area work for you so that everybody can find their happy place within the gray and be satisfied with a settlement where any way you slice it, they're in the range of reasonable. There's an art to knowing when you step away from all the formulas and you just look at what one person is willing to give and what one person is willing to accept. It's a good point. That's an interesting point. Um, we always, I guess, need to be cognizant not only of what our client wants, but what the other side wants, because we don't get a settlement, obviously, if we don't look at that whole landscape. Exactly. Exactly. And just sometimes asking simple questions before you form a proposal. 
like, hey, person with the income, does your client like the idea better of paying maintenance out over time? Or do they like the certainty of knowing they're done today with some kind of a buyout? Just knowing, I mean, identifying the hot buttons is a great exercise to go through, even in an initial consultation. You, in initial consultations, the young lawyer gets the person to tell their story. The more mature lawyer then looks back at the client and says, all right, what's your spouse gonna say about you? What are they gonna say is wrong with you? Where are they gonna say you fell down on the job of being a good spouse or a parent? A lot of times people know that. And then when you're talking to the other lawyer, what's your, side, what's your guys, guy or gal's take on where things fell apart? That can really help you know what things are gonna create issues. Um, I, I've developed my, my phrase because I like food is how do we hide the vegetables in the mashed potatoes? How do we minimize focus on the pieces of a settlement that are gonna drive somebody crazy and focus on the pieces that everybody likes, i.e. the mashed potatoes. Interesting, so you have, you have certain strategies for when you negotiate agreements, and the vegetables and the mashed potatoes is one. Tell me some others. I like to ask my clients whether they think they're gonna do better if they make the first proposal or if they let the other side make the first proposal. I've found you can settle the cases and it doesn't matter who makes the first proposal, but another, another lesson from one of my mentors is the perception is reality lesson. If somebody has a perception that they can only get the best settlement possible if they make the first proposal and you then don't make the first proposal, they're never gonna be satisfied. It's kind of like the philosophy of somebody who feels like they have a lucky shirt. If I wear this shirt to the softball game, my team is going to do great. You got to get underneath the skin of all those little things. How do, you, um, how do you respond where you're dealing with somebody who is not negotiating in good faith? Where, for example, their 30-year marriage guy makes 400000 a year and she's a homemaker and, and no maintenance is offered in their first proposal and no disproportionate division of the assets. How, how do you respond to something like that? After I get done being angry about it, I go to the lawyer and I will say something like, you and I both know that the proposal you made isn't gonna settle the case, why did you make it? I have two choices here. I can make a proposal that's just as extreme as the one you made in the other direction and we can take baby steps toward compromise. Or I can do what I really like to do and respond back to you that your proposal is so far out of the range of anything a court would do that we're not gonna respond. So I've actually had a couple people say, you know what, I didn't realize I was taking us into that territory before I did that. It's really hard when you work hard to master your client to trust you to know what moves to make and what moves are going to really damage both of your credibility to have somebody on the other side who operates like just a conduit if my client wants it i'm going to put it out there and there are times when i will basically say look i'll attribute the bad faith to your client but shame on you for not counseling them better as to where this was going to go well isn't that true i mean just just not being a filter at all for your client's bad impulses, nothing good comes of that. Nothing good comes of that. And I think a lot of times people end up having regrets because of that. Uh, you, you, you raise an interesting point. You get this inflammatory offer, and obviously you get a little pissed at first, but you pick up the phone, and you communicate to your opponent. You don't just shut down the dialogue and start, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails at the other side. You try to figure out what's going on. That's a pretty insightful thing that you do. Well, I think you have to. There are times sometimes when a lawyer I'm working on a case with will walk into my office and say, the other lawyer left me a message. They wrote me this email and they start talking about responding in writing. 
and we'll literally be sitting there like you and I are figured to across the desk from each other. And I pick up the phone and they say, what are you doing? I say, I'm calling them. Another thing that falls into this bucket though is, let's say you try mediating with somebody, you try individual settlement meetings, and you've gone around and around three or four times and the case isn't settling because of what you think is bad faith. But you know you're in front of a judge who expects people to try to work things out. And the other guy comes back at you again saying, you know, we're two months before trial, a hundred days before trial, like your book, and we got to do something. Now's the time to settle the case. There's this urge to look back at him and say, why do you think foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds? Why do you think this time is going to be different? Then you have to control yourself and say, how will it look? And you have to talk to your client. How is it going to look to the judge if the other side can walk into court and say, we called them, asked them to work on settling the case and they refused? Do you think the judge is going to be persuaded and give us a pass because we say we tried three times before and it didn't work? Generally not. You have to participate. So then where do you go? You have a client saying, why are you wasting more time talking settlement with these people? The only thing I've come up with, and I do believe it, because um, I can't do, I'm, I've got a terrible poker face. I can't do things I don't believe in. I'll look back at my client and say, you know what, this may have no value at all to settle your case, but every time I talk to the other lawyer, it's a chance for me to learn things. And every time I learn things, I have the chance to fine tune your case and make it better. Many people, even the ones who are very skeptical about using mediation, as soon as I say, look, it's a free peek at what the other side's thinking, it's a chance to ask questions, not in a deposition and not in a hearing, why wouldn't we do it? They can see another value to it. And sometimes when they focus on that other value, magical things can happen in terms of settling the case. We certainly learn more by listening than by talking, don't we? God's yes. I love the blabbermouth lawyers that are always advocating in the hallway, telling me the theory of their case. I just want to take out a notepad and start writing it down. because. Oh, God, I do. I write it all down. Yeah, they're just telling you where, where they're going to be arguing at trial or the pretrial, and you could prepare for it. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think sometimes they put it out there because they think that it will let them learn from you, whatever you're going to say in response to it. But I don't know about you. I like to marinate on things. I don't ever like to give a knee jerk response to anybody about how I think something's going to go. I, I know what my gut is and I will always share my immediate gut with my clients or with my teammates. But when it comes to the other side, I really think I have to think about things before I either reject or jump on board. Um, a young lawyer years ago came to me after a court appearance and said, I'm kicking myself. The other side came up with something and it sounded good and it got rid of the issue in the moment. And then I stepped away from the bench and I started thinking of other things that maybe I should have considered, maybe I, I shouldn't have. I said, you know what? There's nothing wrong with saying I need a little more time to think about it. If you have a contested motion that's up on Monday and the other side waits until the courthouse steps to give you a possible solution to consider, I don't think any judge is really going to beat you up to say, you know what, Your Honor, can we come back in a few days and have this argument? Because they just gave me this solution. I haven't had a chance to talk to my client about it. And I haven't had a chance to think about it. It's the same philosophy that drives judges thinking that emergency motions are problematic. We don't all have the ability, in fact, few of us have the ability to process what could be difficult and problematic in the moment that you're just handed something on an emergency basis. Well, what, a, what a great comment to have, or to teach a, a newer lawyer, to have the moral courage to basically say, I'm entitled to reflect on this and to think about it, and I'm not trying to delay anything, but you know, 48 hours isn't gonna kill anybody. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. So let me shift gears for a second. <clears throat> You're an accomplished trial lawyer. You're great at it. What, and I know we all work hard to get our cases settled, but some cases can't be settled, as we know, for a variety of reasons. Right. What, what is it that you love about the courtroom? What is the, the thing that gets your juices flowing 
when you stand up and you start your opening statement? What, what is it about a trial that you like? The funny thing that what's going through my head is something that we were told by Monroe Inker, God rest his lovely soul, back when you and I were students in trial school, which is there isn't a lawyer alive that doesn't pray that the courthouse burns down before we get there to start the trial. After 30 years, I can say that as much as I hate that feeling of anxiety, it is part of the process of getting ready. It's like the transformation that the Incredible Hulk goes through to be, you know, the guy that becomes the Hulk goes through to become the Hulk. The Hulk is a very powerful figure, but it's a painful process to get there. I think the part of trial I like the best is the place where I say to myself, like studying for the bar exam, I know I've done as much as I can do to structure this trial in the most effective way. My kick comes from making trials be shorter, more terse, not as extensive. I mean, I remember. I remember watching early trials where you would definitely get the sense that the lawyer who was examining the witness or making the opening statement was making it way too long. And it's because they were still mentally figuring out what ought to be in it. So plan your theory, roll it out, and be confident that you don't need to say any more. Less words is always better. Nothing more. Nothing more of a kick than a cross-examination that goes about five to 10 questions. Uh, better prepared lawyers will try their case more concisely and more effectively, obviously. Right. And that is something I've learned to ask judges for. When you're scheduling trials and the judge says, okay, can you start on June 5th? And I say, well, your honor, I have another trial from June 1st to June 3rd. And they say, Okay, so yeah, you can be here on the 5th. I look at him and I say, I can be here on the 5th, but the presentation won't be prepared the same way by the 5th because when I try a case, the four to five days before the case are when I am trimming the fat off the questions. It's when I'm really focusing on making the presentation to you the shortest, the most effective, using only the exhibits that I absolutely need to use. So you want to give me that so I can give you what you need and you can be effective with your time. Because there's, there's no way you can do all that three weeks before, try a different case and then step in and be that effective. You're, you're illustrating again, baiting the hook for the fish. You're telling the judge what the judge needs to hear to redirect it in a direction that is, is one that you prefer. Exactly. And really, you know, judges are people too. Judge, how would you like it if we finished the trial and expected you to finish a trial on Monday and, and start our trial on Tuesday? When are you gonna write your opinion and collect your thoughts on the first trial? See, they need their time on the back end of the trial. We need our time on the front end. Interesting. I have the highest respect for jurists who write their own opinions. It's all well and good to say, make me your pitch in a closing argument and give me all the statutory factors and match everything up for me. I love it when they write their own opinions. I heard, a, or I read a, a really great tweet the other day about appellate advocacy that said, when you're preparing, you want to be thinking about how I can help the court. You're there to be a helper for the bench uh, in, in large part. Now, a trial is different, of course. You're advocating a little bit differently, but we can't forget that we've got an audience that we need to play to. Well, exactly. And this is, this is a part of client education as well as associate lawyer education. When you have a client who has been made miserable by a spouse, that person might look at you when you're in the moment of the trial when the other guy is fumbling to find an exhibit and you take out your extra and you hand it over. You're not doing that for the other side. You're doing it for the court and you're doing it for the court's opinion of the professional that you are. But you got to tell the client things like that are going to go on 
before you get in the courtroom because that's another one where if they start staring daggers at you while you're being courteous, the judge will think less of them. It's a little bit like um, one of my one of my, one of the people that's influenced me. You know, I, I do ballroom dance. It's my my thing that I do to recharge. But my ballroom dance teachers, every once in a while, one of them says something. And my dance teacher, Melissa, used to say, yeah, you know, it's really important to know when to go all roadhouse on somebody from the, the Patrick Swayze movie. And so explaining to your client that we're going to be nice until I decide that we're not going to be nice is a huge concept. The thing that will feel good, clients don't understand, the thing that will feel good for about five minutes because they feel like they stuck up for themselves will not feel good when it shows up as the reason why they're an untrustworthy person six pleadings down the road. Do you know who Terry McCarthy is? Yes. He wrote a book on um, cross-examination. He was the federal appellate or the federal defender. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, what his theory is, is the key to being an effective trial lawyer is for you to look good and to make the other guy look bad. And anything you can do to make yourself look good is in the plus column. Right. And he uses that as an example in cross-examination when you're a 300 pound gorilla jumping on somebody's head, you might look, actually look bad. You right. might make that asshole witness a victim when you act that way. And it made me kind of reframe my thinking about, you know, every aspect of the trial, we're trying to look good. And what we can do to make ourselves look better is pretty important. And you're exactly. going to tell the client that's what you're doing. Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is there are such, if you look at what courts have, uh, something that, that we do as a matter of, of course is we create indexes that list every filing, who filed it, every court order entered, and what was in the court order, like the subject matter. There was a point and we were talking about something and it occurred to me, if I attach this thing, this will show the disparity in the number of filings and emergencies. When you can change the focus, if the court is focusing on a tiny piece of the case and you can find a way to widen the field of view to a whole course of conduct, you know, the theme of your case might be, the guy on the other side is somebody who can't take no for an answer, can't follow a court order. And when you string together all the behaviors, we have tools that we don't look at. We have tools that we don't even realize we have in the form of you know, showing a judge an index like that. You become somebody who's really reliable because when a judge looks at it and sees the precision of the product, it builds credibility for them looking at your version of the exhibit list versus the other side's version of the exhibit lists. When you remind a judge, let's say a point of evidence gets argued back and forth three or four times after an objection and the judge doesn't articulate a ruling, they just maybe make a hand gesture because it's late in the day and they're, they're implicitly overruling the objection. Being precise and saying, Your Honor, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't hear you, but I didn't hear a ruling go into the record. You know, it doesn't have to be an I'm better than you are kind of thing, even with the other side. Excuse me, maybe I didn't hear right, but I think my opponent just used the wrong name and it would be important to correct the record so that it's clear. Maintaining the dignity of our position, right? And the integrity of our proceedings so that our records don't become problematic. Oh, you just made me think of a pet peeve. True. Sometimes lawyers who are trying to be effective ask us, instead of having this witness testify once in my case and once in your case, can we just put them on once for all purposes? Something I never, ever, ever do. If it's a third party witness, what I would rather do is say, you know what, if we only want the person to come in one day, then we have to think about what we're giving up and what we're sacrificing because let's say it's a witness in my case and I am the petitioner. I'm putting that witness on and there are rules that go with direct and cross-examination. 
staying within the scope of the examination. You lose all those objections as soon as you take a witness out of one person's case or the other. You lose the tennis match of direct and cross and redirect. You also lose the ability to hone a witness's testimony by all the testimony that went before. Let's say I'm the petitioner, or let's say I'm the respondent, and somebody wants to advance someone's testimony to the beginning of their case and they want me to do my whole thing. What if I watch my opponent get to the end of their case and I go, darn it, that witness that we called on the first day, I've got 10 more questions for them based on everything else I've heard. Don't forget the reasons why it's set up the way it's set up. The system is set up to make sure that there's a maximum chance of truth coming out. As soon as you disrupt the order of things, you know, so people whose bright ideas depart from black letter law, people whose bright ideas depart from the way we've been litigating cases for a really long time, bad suggestions. And there's a nice way to look at a judge and say, Your Honor, I'd love to streamline the trial, but I can't do it that way because if this case goes up, the appellate court can't enforce the rules if we change them. And you can get away with that because you have inherent credibility with the court who already knows you're trying hard to streamline and expedite moving through the case. Well, exactly. I mean, I once had a conversation with a judge in, in Cook County. It got back to me that the judge had, been, had made the decision that he would not allow an exhibit into evidence if there had not been testimony about it. And everybody was up in arms about it. So I had no cases pending in front of him. I went over there and I said, all right, everybody's telling me you're doing this, what's up? He said, you know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of doing the lawyer's work. People who come in and dump boxes of exhibits on me, there's not a stitch of testimony about it. I feel like I have a duty to look through it all and figure out what it means and it's me doing their job. Judge, um, Karen Simpson in Kane County years ago required lawyers to highlight the important stuff from the exhibit when they tendered the exhibit. And we all kind of mocked it, but I think it was a great idea in hindsight. Well, I almost want to write it down. And here's why. First of all, that judge and I got to the detente of, you know what, why don't you give the lawyers an instruction that if they admit an exhibit into evidence, and they do not introduce testimony about it, and they do not in their closing argument tie it into the rest of the case, you will not be searching to make their arguments for them. That will force everybody to pay attention. Hang on one second. I told you at the beginning of this that I was using this Instacart thing for the very first time, and I think the Instacart person is sending me a memo or trying to communicate something to me about Oh, isn't that nice? Okay, I'm back. I, I wanna, I'm gonna shift gears now and talk about you as a human being. We have to, before we do that, we have to talk about the highlighting, because this is a, this is a, is, is a tip for in the virtual world. For all of those of us practicing virtually now. I started writing my, my documents for courts differently. Thinking that if a judge is using a computer like I am and only has one screen to play around with, going back and forth between two different documents or killing trees and printing off all the paper may not be viable. We've always been a firm that's worked from not just going admit, deny, admit, deny, but talking about what we are admitting and denying so the court can look at our one document. I've actually started using italics and highlighting to juxtapose the different positions in the case. Within the pleading? Within the pleading. I just recently wrote a discovery objection response where I laid out the original request, the objection in italics, the pertinent instructions that went with it in boldface, and then my response so that the court could process things in linear fashion. Interesting. It's a way of slowing the court, not slowing the court down, but making sure the court touches all the bases because 
Think about it. Do judges at home have access to a pleadings and orders index like what I have? Can they look at everything? How hard is it when you're writing? You're writing, you're on a roll, and then you have to go look up a fact. Derails you totally. It's contextual. You're creating a context for the dispute. Exactly. And context is always important. Um, I'm fond of telling my clients that when you're doing things, you never want to look like the person who's throwing the second punch at the hockey game. That's the guy that always gets caught. Right. And the only way you can avoid it when you're writing about things is to make sure that if the other side says, you called me a name in this, go back three hour family wizard messages earlier and figure out what led to that ultimate comment and put it in context. So what do you what do you do for balance? How do you extremely um, challenging career? Um, you're a mom. You teach. You speak. You're queen of the ABA. How do you how do you balance it all? How do you do all this stuff? I finally developed. And it's funny because you you knew my husband before I knew my husband. One of the things that my my late father loved about my husband. My dad looked at me one day because my dad was a very driven medical doctor. He never had fun. He was not the fun guy. My dad looked at me and said, Ana Maria, you must learn to have fun. Mario, he gives you the fun. So the lesson from my husband, among many others, is find ways to do what you love. He bought us some sample, like he bid on an auction item for ballroom dancing. We took a few lessons together, and I've been ballroom dancing now since 2010. I compete. I love it. I love going into a world where nobody knows me for who I am, where everybody is fully, thoroughly supportive, cheering for everybody, where you can see people. Somebody on the outside would walk into the world of ballroom dance and say, why the heck is that woman wearing that outfit? It's totally not right for her. People in the world of ballroom dance go, oh, God bless this world for letting me dress the way I like to envision myself. So I ballroom dance, I love to cook. I have a garden behind our garage. That was a big debate, cutting green garden, cutting green garden. So I grow vegetables and herbs and I dig in the dirt. Good for your head. Exactly, and I read. That's the biggest thing that COVID has taken away from me. I used to ride Metra into the office and have 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening where I could actually read fiction because I love to read fiction. Yeah, that's not happening unless I really make a concerted effort to not get on the phone or on the computer before I do a little reading. Who's your favorite author? Fiction. John Irving. Who? John Irving. John Irving, yeah, he's great. The Cider House Rules got me through freshman year in college. I read it over and over and over again. I felt like Homer was a friend of mine by the time I was done with that book. I was sad to see him go. I was sad to see him. I mean, I have, I have wonderful memories of reading A Prayer for Owen Meany out loud. Yeah, that's a good, it makes us a better lawyer. I mean, we, we read for fun, but it also teaches us how to use the language more effectively when we read great writers. Well, exactly. And I'm getting to be more of a fan Young lawyers make the mistake of writing things with very fancy, eloquent sentences that you can't use when you're speaking in court. Because when you're looking at the neuro-linguistic programming piece of the thing, you can't know whether your judge needs to see things, hear things, or feel things, so you have to hit all three bases. In writing, I've now evolved to a point where I would rather write the way I speak short sentences that people don't get lost in. And I'm saying that because even now I'm reading a bunch of deposition transcripts for something and the questions are so dang long, I can't remember the first part of it by the time I get to the end. All the, all the writing teachers say that. I mean, you wanna be clear, you wanna have shorter sentences, you wanna have um, Anglo-Saxon words as opposed to Latinate words and yeah. Yeah, don't write like a lawyer. And then the thing that one of the judges told me early on in her career as a judge, leave out all the adjectives and adverbs. They don't add anything to what I'm doing. Yeah. 
And that's probably the hardest part of writing with a client. Writing with a client is its whole own art form. I've had lawyer clients where I would go to their offices, we would sit down, and the client and I would write a document for another partner to review. I've had other things where an associate will write with the client. Sometimes the client doesn't get involved in the writing until the end and making sure that they understand what it all means. Like I had a client once say, you know, I really hate this phrase, so-and-so lacks personal knowledge sufficient to admit or deny and therefore denies. That's the kind of thing you really can't get away from, but there's a lot of stuff you can. By thinking your way through, yeah. yeah. Say it once, say it well, don't repeat yourself. What is, what is the one piece of advice that experienced Anita would give to first year lawyer Anita? Knowing what you know now, living your life as you've lived it, <coughs> besides having fun with your fun loving husband, um, who I, 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 we would need three hours for me to tell you about all the fun times he and I have had. <laughs> but, um, so what, and then he probably have to kill you. Yeah. Um, what, what, would you, what would you advise yourself? What would you say looking back on your life and your career? Looking back on my life and my career, I would say understanding the business end of being a lawyer earlier on would have been something I wished I had had focused on because there are fun parts to the business end of being a lawyer, like the relationships you develop that then become your referral sources. When I was a young lawyer, it was very much do good work for the partners that you work for and everything will be okay. And, and truly, I'm a living example of that because as a young lawyer, you can sit there and go out and meet all the people you want to meet. But if you haven't developed the skill set to really be the knock it out of the park lawyer that somebody wants to hire, you have nothing to sell. You have to develop the talent that you're going to sell. But I think when you understand the business of law, it turns on the lights in so many areas of how you handle a case, how you manage a client, and how you work with other people. Interesting. The other thing is, and this is a hard thing because we're in a business where we go to court and we get judgments. Know the difference between getting judgments and making judgments because few of us are in a position to be able to judge the guy on the other side. You always have to leave room for somebody having a good reason for doing something. Because when you're young, and especially when you're young and you're a woman, and everyone criticizes you for being aggressive, and the partner at the big law firm that you just subpoenaed calls you up and says, does Donnie Schiller know that you're subpoenaing me? And I look at it. Who do you think told me to issue the subpoena? You're building your, your reputation as a woman. When I was a woman coming up in the practice in the early 90s, you definitely had to worry about making sure that people didn't think you could be a pu you know, pushed over. You got to step away from that and realize that there's more to it. You can't be fighting with everybody all the time. You have to learn ways to work with people and to like working with even the most unpleasant people. Sometimes the most unpleasant people will be your clients. <laughs> sometimes they will be the judge. Sometimes they will be the other lawyer. But if you can figure out how somebody ticks, like I have one guy now who's got bad ADHD. He's my opposing lawyer. And he free associates during any conversation. When I finally got to the point where I said, you know what, we're not having productive conversations because you jump around to the point where I don't feel like we ever finished discussing all the points. And then I get off the phone and it's like I ordered the dinner, somebody brought the dinner and then they didn't let me eat the dinner. He actually got better. He said, you know what, do me a favor. When I start going all over the place, stop me. Well, yes, it isn't. The, I, Ask for what you want, everywhere. I'm, I'm thinking, though, of the common commonality between um, great lawyers, including yourself, with that insight 
to be able to step back from the drama and to be able to work your way through it to get to the end zone. Yeah, you do have to be able to move back and forth with the drama. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I've actually had clients, and this was years ago, they would look at me and they would, and here I thought I was being the consummate professional by not getting worked up over some tactic the other guy used. My client called up and there's this just plaintive wail. I feel like you just aren't even bothered by this outrageous behavior. It's okay to show clients that you're troubled by outrageous behavior and to listen to them emotive because that makes it okay. It's like that counterintuitive theory when you burn your finger, run it under hot water. If you call somebody up and say, I'm about to send you a pleading, what the other guy wrote in the pleading is going to really upset you. It really upset me to read that they're headed in that direction. After you read it, why don't you give me a call so we can talk about it? They're prepared to read it. They know that you're outraged. And then when they read it, it won't be this. I got to talk to you immediately and lots of yelling and screaming. I actually have one client who is very dear to me. We've been living together for a long time said, I know we're analyzing this and I know we're thinking through this, but can I just whine for a little bit? Of course. Yeah. I call that a glass of wine call. <clears throat> I'm going to say yeah. this. I want you to pour a glass of wine. We'll work through it. Give me a call when you're done reading it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so sometimes, you sometimes what your intuition tells you is the best thing to do. You're in a mediation and your client starts falling apart and you have the instinct to give them a hug. Give them a hug. Yeah. Or when you get a bad ruling, you get, let's say, uh, your 604 comes back in favor of the other guy. You don't want to just send it to them, send it to the client. Oh, I'm going to be gone for the holiday weekend. Give me a call sometime next week. Unacceptable. Bad lawyer. Right. And you know what? You know what? Extensions of time are always okay. If somebody says, I need extra time on that reply, it's due Wednesday of this week, and you've got a, a weekend coming up, and they say they're, they're worried that you want it right away, and you, they say, you know, I'll get it to you on Friday. You know what? Do us both a favor, take it till Monday because then I won't feel a duty to go through it, read it, and ruin my client's weekend with it. I have a, this is something else I learned real young. Don't ever send a client something and just say, in close, please find the blah, blah, blah. You have to read it. You have to give them something in the cover letter that explains what it is and where it's gonna take things. Even if it means they get the court order a day after the court appearance. And I also tell people in consultations, if you don't hear from me right after court, it means everything's good. My general pattern after court is to write a letter that says what happened at court and what our next steps are. If you really have a burning desire to hear about it the day of, then I will give you a call. You have to tell me that though. Tell me what you need and I'll do my best to give it to you. If you were not, if you were not a lawyer, what would you do? What would you want to be? I think I'd really want to be an actress. But when I was younger, I actually very much wanted to be a teacher. So I found a way to be a teacher in this world. You are a teacher. You are a teacher. Well, I find that when we teach, we learn. Even when I talk to our 15-year-old about studying for a test, I say, you know what? Do all your studying. Do whatever it is you do to get ready and then teach it to me. Because somehow it's, it's like yoga. I like to do yoga. Yoga will tell you to, you know, raise your hand up here. And the exercise isn't about raising your hand. It's about engaging a muscle in your back. Steve, teach it to me. You're going to prepare to the nines to teach it to me because that's the kind of person you are. And in the process, you're going to learn it really well. Don Schiller always said, best way to master a subject area, agree to teach a CLE on it, agree to write a paper about it. Absolutely true. Well, I, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, we could talk for another five hours. I love talking. Yes, to you. Um, I learn every time I talk to you. So, you know. uh, 
So um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and sign off and um, why don't you stay on the line and you and I can talk for a few minutes. Cool, thanks.